Sociologists speak of social stratification to describe inequalities that exist between individuals and groups within human societies. We often think of stratification in terms of assets or property, but it can also occur because of other attributes such as gender, age, religion, or military rank. Globally, all socially stratified systems share three characteristics, which are that the rankings apply to social categories of people who share a common characteristic without necessarily interacting or even identifying with one another. People's life experiences and opportunities depend heavily on how their social category is ranked. And thirdly, the ranks of different social categories tend to change very slowly over time. Around the world, the main systems of stratification include slavery, caste, estates and class, from historical times up to today. Let us define the four types of historical stratification processes, beginning with slavery. Now, slavery is an extreme form of inequality, in which people are owned as property by others. Meanwhile, a caste system is a social system in which one social status is assigned for life. And there is no social mobility whatsoever, so people remain where they are throughout, from birth throughout their entire life. Meanwhile, estates were part of European feudalism, but have also existed in many other traditional civilizations, where the feudal estates consisted of strata with differing obligations and rights towards each other, very much the system during feudalism. This is where we have relations between the aristocracy and the serfs, peasants, merchants and artisans. And finally, we come to the most commonly mentioned type of stratification in sociology, which is class, where it differs in many ways from slavery, caste or estates. Class systems are fluid and they are in some part achieved rather than ascribed and it is economically based and it's also large scale and impersonal. And of course, one social class is defined by one's relations to the means of production, as Karl Marx explained. Stratification is a core area in sociology, according to Ken Worthy, 2007. One of the main goals of classical sociology was to measure and explain the reason for the existence and persistence of stratification. The end result of stratification, which is the segmentation of individuals into categories, is inequality. The social conflict theorist Karl Marx used the concept of social class to describe social inequality in terms of relations to the means of production, as we perhaps have mentioned several times in previous lectures. However, many interpretations of social class exist, differing in their choice of indicators. The pioneering scholar of class, Marx himself, examined one's means of livelihood or occupation. Weber, in refining Marx's class analysis, included a combination of class, status, and party. If you recall earlier, we talked about how Weber added on two more dimensions to social stratification. The Marxists, inspired by Marx, interpreted Marx in two different ways. The first category translated Marx's ideas into what they call a relational class scheme based on occupation and status conflict, while the second category looked at something called a descriptive class scheme. Under the relational class scheme paradigm, Goldtop and the Nuffield School applied an analysis of the market situation and the work situation. This was divided into three classes, the service class correlating with the upper class, the intermediate class correlating with the middle class, and the working class. Here is where Butler and Savage diverge by claiming that in the UK, the middle class has expanded, but its members are more varied in background and interests. Alongside all these, and partly also influenced by, was Bourdieu with his objective and subjective class determinants, which include the various forms of capital, that is, cultural capital, social capital, symbolic capital, and economic capital. The relevance of using social class as an indicator 
has been vigorously debated. Would you claim that the historical success of Marxism is to have fleshed out the idea of class from completely arbitrary attributes shared by an assemblage of people, according to Biroy, 2011. Biroy, 2011, adds that now, Marxism has become the ultimate obstacle to the progress of an adequate theory of the social world. And he states that this is because Marxism has ignored the potential of the symbolic world. It has failed to anticipate the emergence of fields of symbolic production, such as art, literature, science, journalism, etc., all that must precede class struggles. One must not ignore the channels through which symbolic emancipation can occur. This brings us to the importance of measuring cultural participation as a tool for one's struggle for social inclusion. And this is where the cultural capital theories of Bourdieu come into relevance. One of the main goals of classical sociology was to measure and explain the reason for the existence and persistence of stratification. The social conflict theorist Karl Marx had used the concept of social class to describe social inequality in terms of relations to the means of production. However, the definition and operationalization of social class continues to be debated, particularly where materialist and idealist factors are concerned. Bloch, 2013, who has reviewed the various definitions of social class over the years, claims that Bourdieu is perhaps the social theorist who best captured the notion of class in the late 20th century because he included both material states as well as cultural activity. Social class may be made up of more than one type of capital, including cultural, social and economic capitals, with a higher level of social class associated with higher cultural capital. Social class may also be measured through possession of educational qualifications, according to Block 2013. As a socialization agent, it also produces and reproduces social inequality. Throughout the evolution of cultural capital as an explanatory device for social stratification in Europe, the element of language has always remained constant for individuals involved. As a tool of communication, language is used and transmitted through education systems. While one social class may be related to one's use of slang, such as the Eton educated upper class accent versus working class accents in Britain, according to Tyler, 2008, we question if a complete difference in language education may also be measured. Bourdieu, 1984, first coined the term cultural capital to describe the worldview, life experiences, and lifestyle preferences of select groups of people demarcated by their relations to the means of production. Cultural capital includes three forms, objectified, institutionalized, and embodied. The embodied form is the habitus, or lived dispositions. The objectified form is the consumption of commodities. And the institutionalized form includes the legitimacy accorded to forms of cultural capital by social institutions such as education, according to Igarashi and Saito, 2014. Bourdieu's concept of cultural capital places great importance on identity, particularly where habitus as its embodied form is concerned, according to Langman, 2012. Bourdieu's concept became famous in English language sociology from the late 1970s after the translation of his manuscript, Reproduction in Education, Society and Culture from French into English, according to Leroux and Weininger, 2003. Since then, many scholars have attempted to operationalize Bourdieu's cultural capital to explain differences in students' educational outcomes. The field of education has seen many studies conducted using this theoretical framework to establish links between students' cultural capital possession and their academic performance. Nonetheless, these scholars differ in their interpretation of how Bourdieu's concept should be applied and converted into researchable form. The three forms of cultural capital described by Bourdieu include both empirical and abstract elements. The objectified form includes consumption practices, while the institutionalized form includes educational qualifications. The embodied form, meanwhile, can only be interpreted in a phenomenological sense, as it refers to ambitions which require an interpretation of the way respondents create meaning. So the main debate within the application of the concept of cultural capital has been with its operationalization. 
Some scholars believe cultural capital can be empirically described, while others believe it is something that cannot be measured in a scale. Gold Top 2007 summarizes the divide among scholars of cultural capital, classifying their interpretations of Baudu into two camps, the wild and domesticated interpretations of cultural capital. The wild form refers to an interpretation of Baudu in his original, unabridged meaning, where the abstract embodied form of cultural capital is acknowledged. The domesticated form refers to an interpretation of Baudu in a way that converts the forms of cultural capital into empirical attributes. The main reason for this difference in interpretation is that it is almost impossible, according to scholars such as Van der Werfhorst, 2010, to operationalize the abstract embodied form of cultural capital into measurable data. The problem lies with constructing an appropriate research design. In 2013, a major study on cultural capital and social class was conducted by Savage et al., namely the BBC LSE's Great British Class Survey Experiment. The study aimed to elaborate a new model of social class to show how measures of economic, cultural and social capital could be combined to provide a powerful way of mapping contemporary class divisions in the UK. It established the links between class and specific occupational, educational, and geographical profiles. Savage et al. claimed that they are now entering the third phase of the analysis of social class, which differed from the first phase's six-fold approach and the second wave based on occupation, which was developed in opposition to the first wave. Savage et al. 2013 designed the Great British Class Survey to include questions on people's leisure interests, musical tastes, use of the media, and food preferences.